So welcome to uh, Archmere Academy College Counseling Office three question series with the admission office, a, a unique opportunity to interview uh, admissions professionals from across the country and bring them here to Archmere. Uh, we have, we have uh, with us today, Bob McCullough, Dean of Undergraduate Admission at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Bob's been there for quite some time, but does have some Pennsylvania roots, some more local to, to Archmere roots, don't you, Bob? Absolutely. Spent a little bit of time at, uh, in Southeast Pennsylvania at a liberal arts college there. Okay. And Bob's been kind enough to agree to answer three questions for us. The, the three questions, the first one's more about your school, Bob. The second one is more about the industry. And the third one is pretty much application specific. So we will gather a lot of information from you. Uh, so our, our first question is just tell us a little bit about Case Western uh, that, that you'd want everyone to know in terms of families and students. And uh, how can these fam how can our families find out more about these specific things when they're when they're looking at Case Western, whether it's online or, or in person during a tour and things like that, Bob? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks for the opportunity. It's great to uh, to be able to connect with your with your community and talk a little bit about the university and college admissions. So I'll start off with um, you know something that that I think people should know uh, looking into Case Western Reserve. Um, and it sounds obvious, but it's really important. And that is uh, a bit about where we are in our location. So sometimes I think when, when students begin looking at colleges, they tend to focus on, uh, on coastal cities, on places that they might uh, sort of be familiar with and know, and, uh, and sometimes can sort of overlook what might be in the middle of the country uh, and what some people might call the flyover states. Um, we, uh, we, we think that there's a, there's a lot to offer uh, in the center of the country. So I'll start off with, uh, we're, we're in, a state of, in the state of Ohio. And if you look at Ohio uh, from above, it's in the shape of a heart. Um, so that tells you that, you know, home is where the heart is, right? You gotta come to Ohio and check it out. Uh, there's a lot of warmth uh, here, uh, not necessarily in January and February, uh, do you find warmth in terms of the temperature, but there's a lot of warmth in the people and warmth in the communities here uh, in Ohio. And then you take it a step further, and uh, into Cleveland, and, and specifically where Case Western Reserve is. Uh, and Cleveland and, and, and some other cities in this region uh, are sometimes called the Rust Belt. Uh, and so the Rust Belt, people um, sort of use that as per, perhaps a derogatory term uh, for our community because of sort of industries that have changed and uh, perhaps been, been passed by. And I can tell you all about how industries have reinvented and there's all kinds of really interesting things going on uh, in advanced materials and advanced manufacturing. But what I really want to tell you is that, uh, you know, what is rust? Well, rust is oxidized iron. And, uh, and what is pumping through our veins uh, all, in our arteries all the time? Our blood. And what is a, a significant uh, uh, sort of element that's part of our blood? That's right, iron. Um, and so when you think about the Rust Belt cities, uh, we feel drawn to places like Cleveland because uh, it is literally coursing through our veins at every moment, this connection to places like this. So uh, Case Western Reserve is not only where your heart is, is not only where you'll feel connected to because it's your lifeblood uh, that's coursing through your veins, but also our neighborhood is a really fantastic place. We're surrounded by uh, one square mile that is more than 60 cultural, educational, and healthcare institutions. The, the number two uh, medical center in the country uh, is right next door to us and our new health education campus is right there. The Cleveland Orchestra, one of the top five orchestras in the world, is smack dab in the middle of our campus. The Cleveland Art Museum, one of the top art museums in the country, uh, right across the street from us. So when you come and visit Case Western Reserve, and now you know it's, it's drawing you here because it's, it's where your heart is, it's where, uh, where your lifeblood is, spend some time to look around the community. Uh, right around uh, our campus, being able to spend some time in the museums, spend some time in the botanical gardens, uh, but also, of course, a, a very short drive from our campus is the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So you'll be able to, uh, to really kind of get your, get your blood going there uh, and see some, some really cool stuff uh, there on the lakefront. Thank you, Bob. And having been to uh, Case and uh, fortunate enough to spend a few days in Cleveland, I, I wholeheartedly agree, uh, exceeded my expectations. And I actually had some pretty high expectations when I went out there. So a uh, wonderful location culturally, uh, medically, uh, entrepreneurially, uh, great place. 
So we're going to shift gears a little bit, Bob, with the second question, move more toward industry. Uh, we'd like you to tell us a little bit about a trend that you've seen impacting admission practices at, at your school. Uh, what, is, what is the trend and how has it or how will it continue to affect uh, your school and your office? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, the uh, one significant trend and something that we think a lot about is, is just as you, as you think about kind of environmental factors and, and the landscape of admission um, is that, um, that the demographics are shifting and changing. Uh, and so colleges and universities uh, as, as sort of population centers are shifting and as uh, kind of characteristics of students attending colleges are shifting. Um, some of the traditional places where we typically might draw students might not have as many students for us in the future. And so a lot of schools are, are spending and, and have spent over the last uh, several years a, a good amount of time working to uh, build uh, relationships and to build uh, presence in some communities that perhaps we hadn't had presence before. Um, this is an important factor because uh, it, you, you can't sort of suddenly just say, you know, put up a sign and have students flock to you. You have to be able to develop uh, some kind of, of base of, and foundation among students and in schools uh, over, over time. So I think this has also had an impact not only on where we recruit and how we recruit and how we kind of reach out to, to try to build relationships with schools and communities in some areas that perhaps we haven't had before, um, but it also then I think increases the pressure on us as a university to really make the case for case uh, or, or to really help families understand what kind of a place we are. Um, and it isn't just about telling a better story or kind of getting our, our message out there more. It's really about substance. Um, there's a, there, it's a competitive marketplace out there for terrific students. And so um, colleges and universities are, are, being, are, are responding to that. Uh, we're spending a lot of time thinking about what we do as a university, what our educational programs look like, what our opportunities look like, uh, and, uh, and sort of constantly looking to innovate and, uh, and sort of reimagine the ways in which we engage students and help to prepare them for the world beyond our campus, whether that's kind of academically and professionally, uh, but also thinking about students kind of from a, a holistic perspective, how we can help them to connect with people who might have different experiences and backgrounds and perspectives. Um, and, and then how do we articulate all of those different kinds of opportunities out there in a way that helps to set the university apart? So I think that's a good thing. Uh, it's good that, um, that the competition brings out the best in us. Um, and likewise, I think that, that um, students uh, are under pressure uh, to, to think about how they can differentiate themselves uh, as they apply to colleges and, uh, and make sure that they're, uh, that they're putting their best foot forward. Um, this, I think, can have two sides. I think students come to us, um, today's students coming to us are more prepared. They're academically stronger. They've had uh, more in-depth experiences beyond the classroom, whether that's in school-based activities or in being able to pursue opportunities beyond the classroom. Uh, students who have done research, for example, or students who have uh, delved into entrepreneurship as, uh, uh, as high school students. Um, and, and I think in, in many ways that sort of sense of, of, of pushing oneself and, and, and to kind of put a little bit more pressure on, on oneself, uh, likewise can, can bring out some good. But it also has a downside um, and, uh, and can, can sort of fall uh, out of balance a little bit. Uh, and so, so too much pressure can be unhealthy uh, in a way that uh, if students don't have an opportunity to really sort of be in the moment and enjoy being who they are, being high school students, being connected to people within their community, being able to actually enjoy the experience of learning, being able to enjoy the experience of being a part uh, of an activity, whether it's athletics or the arts or some student organization that they're a part of, um, and if, they're, if students are feeling like they're just doing those kinds of things because they're under pressure, they have to do them to be competitive for colleges, that's where it starts to shift into a place where it's, it's less healthy. Um, being able to find the joy, being able to find um, that, the, the meaning and being able to actually uh, be okay with sometimes hitting a stumble, um, that's, that's where it's kind of in a, in a more healthy balance. Um, so the upside of that for us is, as a university 
is that sometimes students are coming to us with a little bit more uh, kind of mental health challenges. And, uh, and we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can make sure we're supporting students who might have put a lot of pressure on themselves, might have felt a lot of pressure, uh, and might have had some experiences where they've needed to, uh, to have a little bit more support around them. Uh, and we're, we're responding to that, fig figuring out how we can be ready for them, how we can best support students uh, and, and help them through. So uh, balance is tricky. It's, 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 and we completely understand that uh, from a, an admissions perspective, um, that we're sending mixed messages. On the one hand, we're really encouraging students to be the best that they can. And on the other hand, um, we wanna make sure that um, they're, they're finding that space where they can find balance. And you know, at, at a certain point, when, when we think about our admissions process, we know that there's a point at which we stop counting the number of activities that you do. We stop counting how many APs you do. It's, it's really about uh, being able to find that, uh, that balance between doing the best you can and pushing yourself, but also having room to be um, kind of in the moment. And that's, that's a tough thing. Um, good news is you've got, you've got a great community there, <laughs> great college counselors to kind of help you navigate that. Bob, a, qu a quick follow-up, because we've had this discussion about activities and the grid boxes on the common application and things like that. So what number do you think you stopped counting at since they allow 10 and many of our students struggle even fitting their activities into those 10 and uh, the coalition is a little fewer and uh, but uh, where at what point do the activities the number the quantity become less important and the quality become more important I, I honestly, I think it's right. It's right from the beginning. Um, the the quality of engagement is is more important than the quantity of of, of hours or or um, separate uh, discrete activities that students are are engaged with. Um, the the, uh, the the idea of holistic admission means that um, not that um, you know that that nothing matters and it's a complete free for all. It's that everything matters and that we spend a lot of time uh, really trying to understand how all of the different pieces kind of fit together. Um, some students are going to have very robust uh, uh, kind of engagement outside the classroom, and other students are going to have very modest engagement outside the classroom, and, and, and a lot of that is informed by uh, the other factors that are part of their lives. Um, and, and when we think about building a class, having students who might, you know, play multiple sports and also be involved in uh, student government and also be involved in, you know, the, the, the theater department and, and everything else, that's, that's one kind of student, and that's really interesting if that's kind of who that student is. But we have other students who might um, uh, be, you know, they're, they're, they work uh, part-time, they're, they're, uh, they have uh, younger siblings at home, they're asked to contribute to their family's finances. Uh, they don't have time to be involved in other, other, all these other kinds of things. Maybe they commute a long way to get to, to school and uh, that takes up a lot of time. And, um, and so when we, when we think about that, it's really kind of understanding how all of those different uh, factors uh, contribute to what we see in the application and what that what that brings out. We encourage students to kind of find ways that they can connect with other students. That's an important reason why we care about extracurriculars. We also encourage students to find ways that they can develop uh, sort of um, interests beyond just what they're doing academically. That's another reason why we, we care about this. And we also care about students who maybe have had a chance to develop other skills such as managing their time. Uh, and if you have other engagements beyond the classroom, beyond your studies, perhaps you had to figure out some strategies to be able to manage your time in a way um, that students who might be less engaged or uh, spend uh, more time on their PlayStation or their Xbox perhaps have, uh, have not been able to develop some of those same kinds of skills. Um, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a bar, it's not a, a set kind of, uh, you know, it, you, you need to have this number of activities, it's not a we're even saying you need to have column A, column B, and column C fulfilled. It's more about have you had a chance to maybe pursue some of those things that are uh, are less um, are less structured or less defined in that way. The time management, working with other people, um, developing some interest beyond just the academic work that you're doing. Bob, thank you for being willing to uh, answer that bonus question, I guess. <laughs> Happy to do so. Uh, third question, our series is very application specific. Uh, we'd like you to share something about the application reading or decision uh, that you feel students and families really don't truly understand either general or something unique to the, the, the process at case. 
Yeah, sure. Um, you know, first it's, there's a, there are so many things that go on um, between the time that, you know, a student submits their application and when they get an answer back. Um, and I think that there's a tendency that is probably, you know, reinforced um, by, by colleges kind of, again, sort of sending mixed messages that, um, that the admission decision is some kind of um, validation or some kind of recognition of how great uh, a student is academically and, and otherwise, or, or even how, how terrific of a job parents did in raising um, their, uh, their, their young person. Um, and you know, even, even saying something like, you know, admissions is competitive at highly selective institutions, I think sort of under, undergirds this, this notion that, well, if it's competitive, then if I'm the best that I can be, then I, I should be able to, uh, to stand out. And I think that's, that even that is, is misleading. Um, sometimes students with, you know, impeccable transcripts, taking all the tough courses with top test scores and, and full resumes and leadership experiences and everything else, still don't get into the colleges or some of the colleges that they most want to get into. Uh, and this is, this is because I think there's a lot of different things that are, that are happening kind of behind the scenes. When we think about building a class, it's about not, not sort of having a scorecard for um, you know, how incredible a student is. It's about how incredible a student is and then how those students are sort of fitting into um, the priorities that we have as an institution. Um, and, and the reality is there's often a lot of competing priorities. Uh, and so the, the kind of idea that there's one applicant pool is actually not right. Um, there's many different pools that make up the overall applicant pool. There's many different groups of students that make up the admission decisions. So at, at a university like Case Western Reserve, as an example, we have four different undergraduate schools and colleges that are all one university, that are all one entering first year class. So when we think about how we want to build a class, from an academic standpoint, students distribute across those four uh, schools and colleges, but even within that, there's a lot of variation. So the College of Arts and Sciences wants students who are going to pursue studies in dance and theater and music, but also students who are going to pursue studies in physics and astronomy and biochemistry. Uh, and, and the humanities, English and, and philosophy and the social sciences. And those are all very different kinds of students who might have very different kinds of interests and come to our applicant pool in different kinds of ways. So one of the things that we sometimes think about is how we can build a class that helps to uh, enroll students where we might have a little bit more room, but also then managing uh, where we might have more demand. We have more students who come to us with an interest in a particular area. Uh, and we have to manage what those class sizes look like so that the, the academic experience is, is what we want it to be for all students who come in. Um, another kind of competing priority that we have broadly is on the one hand, we want to think about how we can be accessible to students regardless of their financial circumstances or their backgrounds or things that might have stood in their way um, uh, to, to kind of put together the kind of application that, um, that might look like a student who, who's had a little bit more advantage or opportunity through the process. So on the one hand, really kind of making sure that we're accessible. We, have, we meet full financial need for all the students that we admit. And on the other hand, being a, a, a university that is able to make the financial stuff work out. Um, that is a, a reality of the work that we do is that the tuition revenue, the dollars and cents all have to come together as we build the class because uh, what we do, uh, what we offer to students, there, there's a cost to that. Uh, there's a cost to the kinds of experiences and opportunities. Most of the cost is wrapped up in people. It's in the faculty. It's in uh, the, the program administrators who help to connect students to some of those opportunities that make them successful when they, when they graduate from here. Uh, and so being able to kind of generate um, the revenue to be able to actually make that work and be able to offer students the kinds of opportunities that they most want is another factor. Well, if you have to worry about making the financial stuff work out, but at the same time, you have to worry about 
how to become accessible to students regardless of, of their financial background, those are things that don't fit together neatly. They actually are, are in opposition to one another. And that's a balancing act. So there's all kinds of examples that I could give you with sort of these kinds of competing priorities that come into play. And as a student, you don't know what that's gonna look like. You don't know what, what of those many applicant pools you're gonna fall into. You don't know where you're gonna fall within, uh, within the, the, uh, the kind of uh, how the applicant pool is composed. And so really the, the best you can do is to have a sense of you know, who, who you are and what you're interested in and to kind of put your best foot forward. I think when students don't get into a college, they take that as that they did something wrong or that, the, that we did something wrong, that we missed out on how amazing they were. And in most cases, that's, that's not the reality. The reality is that um, we're trying to kind of fit together um, what a student brings to us and what they present in the application with what the rest of the applicant pool looks like and what we're trying to kind of achieve as a university. And there's all kinds of different uh, trade-offs that might, might go into that. So um, we've, we've denied and we've waitlisted some really phenomenal students that um, we think would be, you know, would be terrific uh, college students. Sometimes it's that we think they'd be terrific college students, perhaps in a different kind of environment. Sometimes it's that we just didn't have room to be able to offer those students admission. Um, and it's not a validation, it's not a, uh, a, a negative uh, a kind, of, uh, kind of response to, to their application. It's just about uh, the realities of how all of those different kinds of trade-offs and factors came together. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Ms. Souza in our office has a, has a statement in terms of selective and highly selective college admissions. It's not a meritocracy all the time, and, and there are, there are like you said, conflicting priorities. And um, the re one of the reasons why we like doing these interviews and bringing uh, the representatives in to talk to our students and families is to understand decisions a little bit better, um, which I think allows our students to make better decisions along the way. Uh, so, yeah. Absolutely, and, and you know, the, I, it's absolutely true. It's not a meritocracy, but also, um, it, another kind of uh, angle on that is that um, there's not a there's not a universal definition of what is meritorious and um, what that we every college admission office might have a different definition for that and and it and it's going to be relative to um, that individual student and their uh, kind of where they're coming from uh, and how all of those different kinds of pieces fit together so. Um, you know, I think especially sometimes we we uh, engage in, and talk with families where maybe uh, their their family might have might have their experience or their the, the uh, system or the country that they might have come from. Uh, it is you know a kind of strict test based system. If you score this on an exam, you get into this kind of a university or you get into this program at this kind of university. And on the one hand, that's really you know that's straightforward and that's great. Um, but we think that it's really great that, um, that we're, we're not as rigid in that way, um, that we can think about merit in a broader sort of, uh, uh, sort of definition, that we can sort of balance out different kinds of factors that might come in that might impact uh, a student and not just be based on one high stakes exam to be able to make a decision about whether we think a student is, is uh, academically a good fit, but also is, is going to bring, bring something into our community that we value. Bob, thank, thank you very much uh, for entertaining and, and thoughtfully answering our three questions. Uh, I'm sure we'll get a lot out of it. And i um, excited to say, I got your email earlier today that uh, <laughs> those of you watching this from Archmere at least, that Bob will be joining us on our junior college panel in November. So we'll be, we'll be excited to have you on campus. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, Bob. And uh, we, look, uh, we hope you enjoy your summer and uh, we look forward to hosting you in November. I thank you. I, I very much look forward to being there and I'm, I'm glad to be asked and uh, um, it'll be great to get back to you uh, to that region of the country for a couple of days. Take care, Bob.